Oh, well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so yeah, I'm Brian Provinciano, and um, I'm most recently known for Retro City Rampage, which I shipped last year, and it hit all the major platforms, so PS3, uh, PS Vita, Xbox 360, uh, Wii, and PC Steam. And so that was a, a big accomplishment because I went through everything. I developed this game, did all the design, a lot of the art, all of the tech, um, all of the business, all of the production, and did all of the porting and all of that. So it was, when I finally did it, I was really tired and uh, the sad thing is when you go at 200% for so long, then you go at 0% for a little while after because you're pretty exhausted. But um, uh, after I released a bunch of the, the ports, I went back to the initial project which spawned it. Um, and that was a project that I was developing that wasn't faux retro, it was actual retro. It was an 8-bit game running on the NES. And uh, so I will show you that right here. My montage. <laughs> so this was uh, kind of showing you a bit behind the scenes of an 8-bit NES game and how it works under the hood, and that's the audio. So, so this, uh, 10 years ago, this was my desk. Um, I was not just a programmer, but also fiddling with the hardware. And so I built my own NES dev kit. And uh, I built my own SDK. <laughs> and uh, I had it running on the old CRT. So it was, it was a lot of fun. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So it turns out, though, I was working on it part-time while I worked at other companies. And that being the case, especially when I'm spending evenings and weekends at the other companies crunching, uh, the, the development on it was really slow. And, and so over time, kind of, it wasn't just an idea I seemed to have in my head. A lot of people wanted to go back to the retro, make their own retro style games. And so it really started to take off. And, um, and now it's just as flooded as the market is with iOS apps, it's also flooded with uh, fake retro games. Uh, and they're quite popular. And even videos that aren't games themselves get quite popular. So you can see this video, 725,000 views, almost unanimously liked. <laughs> Not so good. I mean, that this crushes me as an artist and uh, as as someone who puts so much time and effort into being authentic. Uh, the general public just can't seem to tell the difference between this and an actual retro. So this talk is going into what makes a real retro game um, and a bit on the hardware side as well and and just why the games were the way they were because a lot of the graphical stylings even of the game evolved because of limitations, whether it was the hardware or the TV signal. So uh, this is what I call those games. <laughs> and uh, hopefully, I, I think that a lot of it just needs awareness. So um, hopefully this can help people kind of put a little bit more effort into uh, doing the retro style. It, it, in fact, doesn't even necessarily take a lot more effort. It really is just knowing what to do and how to do it. So way, way, way back, this was one of the machines that they used for developing Nintendo NES games. This was used developing Super Mario 3. Um, and you can just see how primitive it is. And uh, in the bottom corner there uh, is the EEPROM EEPROM burner. So uh, they didn't have the flash carts like we have today. They had to burn these EEPROMs and then put them under 15 minutes under the UV lamps to erase them so they could write them again. It was a really tedious process. And so we live in a day now where we've got powerful machines and we've got powerful software and we've got high level languages and all of these things that we could do. At our fingertips, we could create not just f full retro games, but actual games that ran on the original hardware and they could be bigger and better than anything that they developed back then because back then they, they weren't just battling with the hardware like the NES limitations, they were battling with the tools and the, the dev hardware and, and those were barriers, those were preventing them from realizing their vision. Um, so uh, when you do go about developing a, a retro style game, I've got some golden rules and I think one of the big things is that we don't have to ab abide by every single last limitation. and, and Games have evolved, players have evolved, and also our memories. Uh, we, when we think back on Super Mario 1, it doesn't look as bad in our head as it actually does. <laughs> and, um, and so one thing is to 
potentially evoke that how it feels in our head than actually what it really looks like. Um, so one of the first things is is the color usage, and. So anyone, look at this picture of Mario 3 and think, think to yourself, uh, how many colors do you think the NES is capable of displaying? 16? 16. 854. Okay. At one time. Eight. Okay, uh, so this is another picture, so uh, you can, another frame of reference. Four per sprite. Okay, so yeah, uh, it's kind of a trick question. There are uh, 13 background colors without, you, you know, using special programming tricks and uh, 12 sprite colors. But in fact, it is a four color uh, image underneath. It's the same as the Game Boy, two bits per pixel. Um, and because it's broken up into these eight by eight tiles, each tile can use a certain set of four different colors. And so, each tile is a four color tile, but it can use one of four sets of different uh, colors. Um, and those colors come from a 56 color palette. And so both of these things create the style and create a look. And you'll be surprised because in Retro City Rampage, I added a mode where even though it was adhering more towards the NES style, I had palettes so you could switch to a Commodore 64 style palette, Apple II style palette, and um, and so forth. And even though it wasn't necessarily matching the, the resolution of the Commodore 64 or something, even running the game in that palette, it still did evoke some feelings of uh, a Commodore 64 game. Uh, the other thing is that when you start taking on limitations like this, you're kind of getting a free art director on, or at least, you know, part time, because with any game, if it's a AAA game or whatever, they're going to pick, okay, what's the tone of this area? What kind of theme should it have? And these hues of colors and so forth. And, and when you are forced to do that, you can find, okay, well, I can only use these colors. I need some complementary colors. I, and, and so when you do have a, a, fit, a set tone for your game, it, it does give it a more consistent, a more professional look. And so again, the two-bit color. And then this is when it's colored, because each color has either a green palette, a gray palette, a blue, or an orange. Um, and like I said, the 8-bit the game here, it uses 2-bit color. And, and you know, the Sega Master System had 4-bit color and so forth, but uh, generally speaking, they look about the same. Um, and so if you are interested in doing this, uh, the best starting point is to just go on Wikipedia. They've got all the palettes there, and you can grab it. Um, just look up any old computer or uh, console. And another point of reference is uh, looking at PC games and stuff where the EGA was 16 colors, so it's actually less colors than the NES, but you're not limited to 2 per 8 by 8, to 2 bits per 8 by 8 and so forth. Uh, on the other side is VGA, which was Leisure Suit Larry um, with 256 colors, and this is what 16-bit games. So generally 16-bit games have 8-bit color, and 8-bit games have 2 or 4-bit color. Screen fades, this is something that uh, most games get wrong. Um, and so here's a video to show you what I mean, and you'll recognize it immediately. So you can see how the palette is stepping down. It's not a smooth fade. So. And the reason for that goes back to the fact that there were only 56 colors available. And so if you wanted to fade from blue to darker blue to darkest blue to black, or vice versa back to uh, white, you only had a finite number of colors that you could cycle through. And, and that gives it a really distinct look that whether or not anyone who's a random person can remember that, if they see that, it's going to hit their subconscious. And uh, so. These limitations also produce the art style as well. And so you'll notice when you looked at a lot of games, they had these linear gradients instead of um, the dithering. And of course, the linear generally looks better at low resolution anyways. Um, but this was caused by the video signal. And so you can see here, um, the, the light blue lines that are going horizontally look great. As soon as you start to switch, especially from dark colors to light colors, you really get this rainbow banding. And I remember when I was a kid noticing this on Contra um, with the trees and foliage. So 
you didn't necessarily really notice this back then because there wasn't anything better. Now that we have LCDs and we're used to RGB monitors and stuff, it, it, it becomes very apparent. And things like component cables will actually help this, but um, when it's the old uh, composite cable, it's just this is what we were looking at. Um, and this is another example with Sonic where you can see the rain where each pixel is separated and so in the middle is an arcade style RGB monitor so that was where they had three separate signals for red, green and blue and the, the composite it's got everything rammed into one cable so there's noise and they distort each other and so it's kind of a little bit distorted in the middle and then uh, really distorted on the TV and you can see it starts to get a little rainbowy in the waterfall which would be a cool effect for an artist to do but <laughs> um, and then this is another trait of NES games that uh, people will recognize is there was always that shadowing. And this was used because there was the background color, that common color, because you had the four palettes, but one of the colors was always the same between them. And that was generally black. And so they could use black to blend things. Um, and you would blend to avoid having this grid-like pattern. And so even here you can see the grass to the sidewalk, the green to the blue, um, where I have the black trim just to make it look a little more organic and a little and less grid-like. And another example with Batman and another example with Batman, you can see how the water coming out of the sewers there, the red and the blue, it blends and it doesn't really look grid-like because they really used the black shadows to good effect. Um, and another trick is just anti-aliasing because when you've got big pixels and something's not a straight line, it can look really bad when it gets diagonal. And so blending things with uh, a, midi a middle ground color really helps a lot. And that's a lot for the quality as well. And in some cases it would indeed help with uh, the composite cable video signal. Um, so how many people have seen my making of ROM City Rampage video? Excellent, cool. So you'll recognize the scrolling here. So the system works like a conveyor belt, like a treadmill, where it's going around. And because the system was set up by 8 by 8 pixel tiles, you could just simply just write one byte and it would set one of those tiles. It would be writing a big block of pixels all with one byte. Because um, the system wasn't powerful enough to write all of those pixels, nor did it have enough memory. And so you would draw a new row of pixels and then hit the scroll register, which adjusts the the uh, conveyor belt and uh, and it would scroll the screen and that's why platformers that were side scrollers were such a big thing for example because that was what the hardware was good at and, and you'll see with a lot of games like David Crane talks about it with the Atari 2600 and we see this time and time again with, when with the Wii Remote came out and with touchscreen devices when you build a game around a hardware feature it's going to be a lot better than if you try and retrofit like when they would try and take arcade games port them to the 2600 it didn't necessarily work so well same thing is when people try and port console games to iOS, the touch device, it doesn't necessarily work, work as well either. So there was some trickery that you could do with the scrolling, which was really cool. The NES didn't have multiple layers, because if you notice you played Super Nintendo games or something, you would see that there would be trees moving in a different uh, speed in the background from the foreground and things like that. Um, the NES couldn't do that, but what you could do is you could adjust the scroll register on a per scan line basis. So what you saw there was just moving the entire screen. But what you could do is you could do special timing where you're moving each individual line. Um, and when you do that, you can actually get the same effect. And with some artistry as well, you don't really notice that th these aren't layers. They look like layers, but uh, in fact, they're just straight lines. And, and then when you mix in some sprites there as well, you can really add extra layers. Um, so this led to another trait where you'd see Castlevania, Super Mario 3. All of these games would have these status bars or these HUDs that took up, just had a black background usually and took up a big chunk of the screen. Whereas in Super Mario World, they had them where they overlaid the screen. Um, and, and this was again because there weren't layers, so you had to choose whether you wanted to render the play field or render the background. Exceptions are games like Mega Man where they used some sprites because they just had one P meter. But if you had to display as much as Super Mario 3 is displaying, for example, you would have to use the background tiles. So this is where 
the biggest uh, travesty comes from. And this is something that I would have thought is common sense, yet uh, more games than not make this mistake. And so uh, it's pretty important to cover. Um, we get this issue where you can see there's just the the character sprite is using mixed pixel sizes and and uh, the background and so forth it's a very simple problem to fix simply you choose your screen size whether it's an NES style 256 by 240 or 320 by 200 um, you render everything to that tiny little thumbnail and then you scale that thumbnail up and everything uh, is consistent but if you really want to get into it um, we live in a different day now, so we're all used to looking at things on LCD monitors, and they do display things differently from the CRT, like, like I showed with the Mega Man picture before. Um, and this is kind of where we face a, a point where we want to simulate the original games, but we do have to, it's a bit of a fork in the road because we can either make it look as good as possible on an LCD, or we can try and simulate the CRT as closely as possible, but it won't look as good as the original CRT, so it's kind of a step backwards. Um, and, and that's finding the right balance. And so I think it's best to focus on um, making it look as good as possible on the LCD and put that as the higher priority. And the funny thing is, is that the purists who still play their games on the original consoles and still have a CRT TV hooked up, they know the difference. But I think most people have been playing the games emulated on their Wii that they purchased through the virtual console or things like that, they don't remember them playing as they did on the CRT. Right now in their minds, they see them as they display on LCDs anyways. So that's kind of a funny thing is that memory has been replaced. So with LCDs, you know that every single pixel is a finite size and it's illuminated on a grid. Uh, with CRTs, it worked differently. A beam would go from left to right, top to bottom, and it would draw the screen pixel by pixel. It wasn't necessarily on a grid so much, and so it could draw wider pixels or narrower pixel pixels, and if we wanted a, a taller screen or a shorter screen, it would space the lines, uh, the scan lines further apart. And so it gave quite a different image, and it also allowed you to do other things. Um, and so on the NES, for example, the screen was 256 pixels wide, but it was effectively stretched to 320. And this allowed them to save memory and also uh, because of bytes. Um, the 256 bytes allowed them to use a single byte to index things. And so there are many reasons why it made sense to use 256 pixels. The difference was is that you were effectively drawing to a one-to-one a -one, uh, screen, but it was four by three. Uh, when it was displayed. And so certain games used certain, used tricks like this. And so the arcade monitor, for example, was a one-to-one -one ratio uh, for Ghosts and Goblins, so they could draw these detailed sprites. When they drew them on the Super Nintendo, they would draw them squashed, and it would save memory. When it stretched out, especially using the CRT effects, where it's just not, it's an analog signal. It's not precise like an LCD digital signal. Um, the end result would kind of look like the arcade version, but it would be using less memory. So these tricks could be used to their advantage, uh, but then we're faced with some other things like when we're emulating these games, if we're stretching things 25%, that's going to lead to jaggy pixels on an, on an LCD. And, uh, and also, if they're not square pixels, if we've got a game like, for example, my game, where you're driving up and left and diagonally, it would feel like you're moving at a different speed horizontally versus vertically. Um, and so that's when you start to realize, OK, well, that's something that maybe I should bend as well. So these are the examples of, of scaling, um, I'm sure most of you are aware of, where there's when you anti-alias it, it just blurs it uh, and doesn't look so great. And when you would use the pure pixel, if it's not uh, a whole number, then it also looks pretty poor. Um, so what I did for RCR was I decided to give up that 256 by 240 resolution. And I ended up embracing this ridiculous 416 by 256 because that would allow me to go 16 by 9. And I used scaling and cropping together so that I could um, avoid the black bars as much as possible and still stick to whole pixel zooms. So this is what it ended up looking like, but um, it could also render in a 4x3 for the purists with a border, and in fact on the Wii, for example, this is all it displays. Um, 
on the Wii, specifically, for example, because it's a standard definition system, I chose not to allow the widescreen at all um, because it uses a standard def video buffer. And it's up to the TV itself to stretch that to be widescreen. And so whatever the make, the model, whatever, that's unpredictable. And when it's a 3D game using lots of colors and whatever, you don't notice this. Uh, but when it's a pixel perfect game, especially with scaled up pixels, when you start to see where it's like one pixel, two pixel, three pixel, one pixel, two pixel, instead of a consistent amount of pixel zoom, uh, it really looks poor. So I chose to just allow four by three on that. So like I touched on before, you know, how do we remember 8-bit? And this is something even I myself can look back on because I hadn't played Super Mario 1 in a long time, and I, but I had been playing NES games still. So I'd been playing Super Mario 2, Super Mario 3, and those looked substantially better than Super Mario 1. And when I went back to Mario 1, I was shocked by just how ugly the mushrooms looked. And because uh, in my mind, Mario 1 looked like Mario 3 as I remembered it. Um, and so that's something that we need to think about. Um, and that's something that it's a blessing and a curse because RCR adheres fairly closely to NES limitations, but does it adhere too closely? And well, you know, I, I may have shaken my fist a few times when people point to some game saying, this game, which they don't know uses 3D hardware and particle effects, blah, 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 um, does retro way better than Retro City Rampage. Um, you know, in one hand, they're wrong. And on the other hand, you know, there's something there. Um, and, and so, you know, you want to adhere, to adhere to limitations, but it is okay to bend the rules. And in fact, you know, user experience always uh, trumps authenticity. And some platform requirements will force you to. And localization as well, because some strings are just super long if you want to display all the leaderboard items. Uh, I had to break the tile limitation and have variable width fonts to make sure that I fit as many words as I wanted on the screen. Um, but user experience is a huge one. I spent a lot of time on RCR battling with the, hard, the fake hardware limitations to try and display good tutorial messages. And uh, so at first it was, the text pops up on the bottom. No one noticed it. Okay, the text pops up under the status bar on the top. No one noticed it. Okay, it appears on the status bar flashing. No one noticed it. Uh, eventually, I had to um, just have some stuff that pops up and like a layer. And the NES didn't support layers, and that was not really accurate at all. But at the end of the day, you can't, <laughs> user experience has to, if the tutorial messages, if people couldn't see them, they would just be so frustrated. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. Um, and so those are things that do need to be addressed and are worth addressing. So that's, that's the talk. And um, if I, I'm an open book for a lot of questions if you have about indie development, the multi-platform porting, the NES development. Um, and if we can get audio, I will also bring up the video for um, the making of ROM City Rampage for those who haven't seen it. Um, the video itself discusses, uh, let's see, uh, there we go. Uh, so we're good to go on that. Um, the video itself discusses how when I decided to go back to the um, the original NES project that I was working on. And then when I moved from that to creating a faux retro project that broke the limitations and I and worked on modern consoles, I decided, hey, I've still got this huge code base and all these tools that I built that did run on the NES. And I've still been doing these assets in two-bit art. Uh, let's see how much I can cram it down into, to show a side-by-side -side comparison to what really was possible in the 80s. So hopefully we've got sound here. Oh, good. Before Retro City Rampage, I was developing another game, a real 8-bit game which ran on the real thing. My focus shifted, though, as I became less interested in battling the hardware limitations and more in creating the best possible game. So I shelved it and started working on RCR. However, after completing that, I decided to dig it up again. And now, you'll be able to see what really was possible in the 80s and how a real 8-bit game is made.
So what are we dealing with here? The 6502 8-bit CPU running at 1.78 megahertz. This was used in the Apple II, the Commodore 64, and of course, the NES. 10 kilobytes of RAM, a 2K base with 8K extended, 32K of program ROM at a time for both code and data, 4K of sprite graphics ROM at a time, and a whopping 256K of background graphics ROM thanks to the cartridge hardware. <laughs> to make the most of the system's limited memory and speed, tile-based graphics are used. Images are broken up into 8x8 eight eight pixel tiles, and duplicates are discarded. As a result, the required ROM and RAM size is much smaller. The background can use up to 13 colors at once, but being only 2 bits per pixel, the tiles are actually just 4 colors. This is where the palette comes in. While each 8x8 tile can only use four different colors, which four colors it uses can be selected from up to four palettes. Each palette has three unique colors and a shared background color. Note that when a game is labeled as 8-bit, it's referring to the CPU. 8-bit systems generally only supported 2-bit or 4-bit color. 8-bit color was something of the 16-bit and VGA era, and actually gives you a whopping 256 colors. The world in RCR used nearly 30,000 tiles, but this needed to be under 8,000. I could either heavily simplify the graphics or reduce the size of the world, and so that's what I did. The easiest tiles to cut are those which are only used once, for example, store signs, statues, or foliage. There also weren't enough sprites for the dynamic props. And finally, I had to simplify the sidewalk pattern to repeat a single tile instead of multiple ones. It finally fit, and despite the cuts, the majority of the detail still remains. I allocated 64 tiles for the character sprites. This gave me a three-frame walk cycle of 16 directions and seven different character types. And because you can mirror sprites, you can reuse the same tile for walking left as walking right, so you can get 16 directions down into just nine sets. To crunch further, the north and south walk cycles, normally three frames, could be done with just two, also using mirroring. And while the sprites could move in 16 directions, if I stored heads only for the primary eight, those nine sets crunched down to five. Each car is 24 by 24 pixels and can drive in 16 directions. We also need two types, a police car and a normal one. Calculated, that adds up to 288 tiles, over twice the limit of 128. Mirroring the 16 directions to 9 brings it down to 162, and ensuring non-diagonal directions use less tiles brings us down to 144, but we're still over. So to crunch things further, we need to do more than just combine duplicate tiles, we need to combine similar ones as well. In this example, the sprite now uses seven unique tiles instead of nine. Each 8x8 tile is 64 pixels, and if six of those pixels match, they're treated as duplicates. You surely remember the sprite flickering, but you might not know why it happened. Well, there were 64 sprites available, but only a maximum of eight per line. With cars being three sprites wide, more than two results in flicker. Interestingly, the game's code did the flickering manually. The system itself just stops rendering after the 8th. With its 1.78 MHz CPU, high-level languages such as C++ are out of the question. Not a single line of code from RCR could be used. Instead, you're down to the metal with assembly language. Unsatisfied, I wrote a high-level assembler to give me the benefits of both worlds, and also started writing macros. Macros simplify your code, enabling you to represent multiple lines with just one. You retain the performance of assembly language while gaining a syntax closer to C. I also added many other C-like elements to the assembler, making if statements and loops cleaner, adding structs, adding switch and case, and familiar preprocessor directives. This all saved me a huge amount of time. Note that I actually released the assembler open source many years ago, so if you want to tinker with it, go right ahead. How the code is accessed adds another challenge. You have 32 kilobytes of program ROM, but it's split up into four slots, 8K each. The total ROM size is 512K, but you can only access it 8K at a time by swapping bits and pieces of it in and out of these four slots. The limited memory adds to the complexity, as you'll often exceed a bank's 8K. You'll then need to move code or data from one bank to another, and this slows things down because you'll then need to swap its bank in and then out every time you access it. Meet 
the vertical blank or the V blank. Depending on where in the world you were located, your game would run at either 50 or 60 frames per second. Each frame contained two key states. The first and majority of the frame time was spent while the TV was drawing the picture. Pixel by pixel, it draws from top to bottom. Once it reaches the end, the beam moves back up to the top to draw the next frame. On systems such as the NES, only during this short period at the end of the frame could you change the graphics. There wasn't enough processing power or system memory to draw the entire screen pixel by pixel. However, thanks to the 8x8 pixel tiles, the entire 256x240 pixel screen was drawn with just 32x30 30 bytes. However, it wasn't powerful enough to even write that many bytes at the end of each frame. Instead, you were mostly limited to just a couple of rows at a time. But this was perfect for the popular side-scrollers of the day, making them no coincidence. And still, you got quite a bang for your buck. With a small 32-byte write, you were drawing 2,048 pixels. This is the screen scrolling as you see it. And this is what's really happening as we write one row at a time. We pan the scroll register up and down and it loops around, displaying as a moving playfield. One major programming challenge was the lack of a debugger. There's no source level debugging, no watch window, no debug renderer, not even printfs. Writing a full emulator in IDE with all of these features would have taken a fair bit of time, so I took a shortcut. I had already written an emulator, and the assembler exported map files, which show the location and memory of code and data. So in my emulator, I wrote functions to pull this out, and as the game runs, display it. The variables, arrays, and structs. This effectively gave me a watch window and the ability to render debug shapes. I could also hook into functions and analyze the game at specific points. While I never got around to adding music playback to the 8-bit version, RCR boasts over two and a half hours of authentic music. The music and sound effects for RCR were composed in impulse tracker format using the free tool ModPlug Tracker. These can be automatically converted to run on hardware using the tool IT to NSF. The only real potential hiccup comes from the various tempos used by the music to create our widely varied soundtrack. If the tempo doesn't nicely match up to the system's frame rate, certain modulated effects could sound incorrect. Everything was composed to the accurate specs with two pulse waves, a triangle, a noise, and one bit DPCM for samples. The only place where the specs were bent is in the playback. For a better overall experience, RCR allows for smoother fades and simultaneous playback of multiple sounds. On a real NES, either sounds would need to drop for others to play, or certain channels would need to be reserved for each purpose. For example, the sound effects might use the triangle and noise channels, and the music would use the square and DPCM. Chiptunes are also why the Wii version of RCR is only 10 megabytes. Two and a half hours of music crams down into just one and a half megs. <laughs> I wrote most of this 8-bit code 10 years ago. If I were to write it again today from scratch, I would be able to better design the engine and likely double the frame rate. However, this still gives you a good idea of what was possible back then. To completely tap into the system, everything must be designed in the most optimized way. The size of objects alone, for example, could mean the difference between 30 and 60 frames per second. And while it can get very complicated, it's also very fun figuring out how to make everything fit just right, not unlike a game of Tetris. With all that taken care of, the game is finally running. You can see side by side how it compares to RCR. Much less detail, but still impressive especially when you realize that it could have actually been released in 
So I guess there's time for questions. I have no idea. <laughs> I was on schedule. All right. So, in um, oh, retro versus ROM, you used uh, palette swaps for cars. In ROMs, your amp page, you only have one car type. You didn't do any palette swaps on it. Um, so, I could change the color, but I didn't have enough memory to have actual actually different graphics. So, it was like, oh, there's the red car, the blue car, and the <laughs> yeah, orange car. Um, have you ever thought about? Taking the things that you use to shoehorn this into an input system and applying that kind of ruthless mentality to um, a modern engine and, and you know, seeing how much you could actually eat out of a the most modern. Engine. It's it's definitely possible. I mean, I'm I'm exploring um, what I can do right now with uh, certain things like that, like I'm working on uh, a destructible world right now um, for the next game because. You know, it's it's uh, when you're doing a simplified game, it, whether it's 2D or whatnot. Uh, you, I mean, I guess you can see even with uh, all sorts of games are doing that now, where the world is just completely dynamic. Um, but uh, it it kind of reminds me of a funny thing where I was working on Sonic Rivals on the PSP, um, and that was a 3D game, 2.5D. And uh, as a lot of people know, often alpha. Um, translucency is, is expensive and so when he got hit and all his rings came out and they had they were fading away and uh, it was a little bit of an impact on the frame rate so I made them flicker uh, to disappear like a retro game and, and that was uh, I as a fun memory just because it added the nostalgia but it also solved a, a performance issue <laughs> yeah. Uh, how long did the work for ROMs and RAMs take you? It wasn't too long, because um, I had originally done all the work, and so I spent um, d over a year of time originally developing all the tools and the engine and everything originally for the original uh, game ten years ago. And so then I, it was just a matter of pulling it out, and I got the city working in it um, fairly quickly. And actually, to my surprise, I was like, I didn't update these file formats in 10 years, wow. Um, and, and that was pretty cool. Uh, and then I went in and the sad thing was is that I wasn't as good maintaining code back then as I am now. And, um, and I always uh, strive to keep a stable build right now um, and fix A bugs immediately. And these are some mantras of mine. But back then, it was like I was working on it, adding features. Oh, the collision got broken. Oh, I don't feel like working on that right now or fixing it. I'm going to add this mission now. That's more exciting. Um, and so in the end, when I went back to my old backups, I had a build where collision worked. And I had a build with missions, but the collision wasn't working. And um, about. Before my GDC IGS talk a couple years ago, um, which was where I started actually pulling uh, this out of the, dusting it off to show it a bit, um, I wanted to get a working build going. And I spent an entire day trying to fix the collision uh, and to integrate the two builds together to create a working build. And I couldn't read my own assembly language. <laughs> uh, so it was, uh, so that I had to just write that off as a, a lost productivity day and move on. And then um, earlier this year, I went back to the code and I, I figured, okay, I'm going to actually make this happen. And I was able to figure it out. And, and that was actually what made me write that emulator with the hacked debugging functionality so I could actually f visualize the collision because it is when you're going back to a 10 year old assembly code base that you can't comprehend at all even the person who wrote it and you're trying to debug collision <laughs> it just it was very tricky so um, that was pretty handy yeah, yeah. I was uh, noticing that you're using a lot of shots of uh, uh, I don't know, the, the sequel to be the original NES Batman game based on the Tim Burton movie. Yeah. Um, not to be confused with the actual sequel to the Tim Burton movie. Uh, and I recall the magazines of the day advertising that game as having, quote, graphics almost as good as 16-bit. And I'm looking at it, and, and what you were talking about with making something look retro or, or look nostalgic. In that sense, are you going for the stuff that's more kind of toward the end of the NES's life cycle? Because I, I recall that the, the SNES was 
you know, had just come out when that thing was released or yeah. was just about to. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so there are a couple of things I'll address there. One was that one of the tricks that they did there for that game was to layer sprites. And so even though each sprite could only have three colors, um, they would combine those two sprites so they could have six colors. Um, and it, it, it cuts it in half, so instead of having 64 sprites on screen, you can only have 32. But you know, you work with that into your design, and you create a better looking game. Um, and uh, for the reason why I say 1989 and not 1985, um, was because it's using the NES when it came out, you know, saving money, memory was expensive, all that. The actual base NES system was very, very underpowered. And if you look at the first generation games, Donkey Kong, uh, Super Mario Bros. 1 was actually running on a base NES, but like games like Duck Hunt and all that, Bomberman, those games used up to 32K of program ROM flat and up to 8K of graphics ROM flat. That was it. Um, but the NES was built so that it could be extended, and that was the most exciting thing. And, and no system, as far as I know, has been built like that. The Game Boy didn't have this, the Master System didn't. Um, and the ROM, the graphics ROM and the program ROM were completely separate chips, and they fed right into the machine. And so you could do really crazy tricks um, with additional cartridge hardware, and so that's why as games went on, they got better and better. It wasn't entirely that the programmers were figuring out better ways to tap into the system. It was that they were putting extra hardware. So the, you remember the Super Nintendo FX chip. Oh, yeah. Well, pretty much every NES game had a chip to that effect. Not even a fraction as powerful as the FX chip, but every game basically had some little chip that added a bit to the NES. Um, and so the most exciting thing about it is that, as I mentioned, where the screen draws it from left to right, top to bottom. That was in real time. So in real time, it was fetching to figure out which tile should I draw, go to the graphics ROM, pull the data from that graphics ROM, and then directly render it. And um, so you could technically do timing stuff on the cartridge hardware and do all sorts of crazy tricks. On the original NES, for example, it wasn't actually um, an 8x8 pixel tile that could have the four colors. It was a 16x16 16 16, uh, tile, so it was even, even worse. Um, but using extra cartridge hardware, the MMC5 chip, which was used in Castlevania 3 and uh, Koei games, that allowed you to do 8x8 because what it would do is it would time. It would say, okay, I've fetched like eight pixels worth of tile. Now I'm going to fetch this extra info that says which palette it should be and switch it between. Um, and so you could technically write something that would take a video signal. And I always thought about this as a joke 10 years ago. like having a video output from a PS2 go into a cartridge on the NES and use the cartridge hardware to render that in tiles. And it would be possible. It would look terrible, but it would be possible. And that was the exciting thing about the NES. You, that cartridge harnessed so much power. And there was also that rumored Hellraiser game that was supposed to be uh, this ridiculous NES game. And there, no one knows whether it was fully past the prototype stage or even if it existed or if it was just on paper. but. That was possible, and I think that uh, what held them back was just they were going to put like $150 of hardware in the cartridge, and no one would buy a game that cost that much. I recall that was part of why Nintendo was so hesitant to leave the, the uh, cartridge-based media, because they didn't want to lose that accessibility. But on the other hand, the cost of the cartridges was just ballooning so high Yeah, it was hard to make money off of it. Yeah, it, it cost... Um, the number I heard was... Oh, man, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it was at least... I think it was like at least eight bucks a cartridge just for the licensing fee um, for every copy of the game. So it was, it was a tricky business. Yeah. Are you trying to capture a, a certain emotion um, with these games, or is it more of an a, a impressive technical challenge for you? And if, if so, like what's, what's next with this, this type of screen? So that's exactly why I, how I transitioned. And, and it's an interesting thing of my career how I started out as a programmer and then became a programmer designer. And that was part of my evolution of originally it wasn't about making a good game. It wasn't about 
any of that. It was about the technical challenge, fighting the NES to make it do more than it's ever done before. And I wanted to see, hey, can I take a game like GTA 3 and have all of the same core mechanics, the same missions and all that, and get it working on an NES to prove that you don't need 3D hardware to still evoke this same game. But it was just a tech demo. It, was, it wasn't... At the end of the day, I didn't care. I knew it wouldn't be fun. I knew it would be diluted, but I thought it would still be a cool for a novelty reason. And, uh, and then as time went on, I was like, why am I putting so much work into this thing that's not going to be fun? <laughs> and, and so I shift my focus. And in time, originally, uh, Retro City Rampage was like completely strictly NES. Even though I was building it on PC and for consoles, it was strict to the hardware. And in time, I started to realize, like, you know, I had sprite flickering in there at one point. I was like, that's not fun. Um, and, and I started to bend things here and there, yeah. So, yeah. One more. Okay. So, uh, was the NES your, your Everest, or are you going to go right for Fedrix, or something more primitive? Ed, Ed uh, is the guru beyond me. Okay. So, uh, Halo 2600. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I think he trumps me, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to have tackled the NES. I, I don't want to tackle the Atari 2600. <laughs> and I don't yeah. want to do the NES. So All right. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you so much.